welcome everybody to another Agora webinar, um, which is actually the fourth now since we started two weeks ago, I believe. Um, today it's going to be about making the most of offshore wind, re-evaluating the potential of offshore wind in the German North Sea. Um, now, who are we? Agora is an independent think tank. A lot of you may know us, but for the ones who don't, we work on making the energy transition a success. We are funded by two private foundations. And at the moment, we are 43 or 45 or something. I've lost track a little bit because we are constantly growing. Um, on the panel, you can see Matthias Deutsch, who's senior associate of the Germany team of Agora Energiewende. Then Axel Kleidon, who's research group leader at a Max Planck Institute. And we have Jake Badger, head of section at DTU Wind Energy. And DTU is for Denmark's Techniske, Techniske Universität, which is Technical University of Denmark. It's a lot easier in, in English. Um, there's also Janne Görlach, who's trainee at the comms department at Agora Energiewende. I'm Nicola Bock, I'm the head of events at Agora Energiewende, and I will make you um, familiar with the um, introduction and housekeeping rules we'll have during the webinar. Now, what's going to happen during the next hour? We will have a presentation of Matthias, Axel and Jake for around 25 to 30 minutes. And we will then have some 20 minutes left for your questions. So we should be ready by noon. Um, even though we cannot see you, let me just check how many we are at the moment. I look at 156 participants. We cannot see you, you can see us, uh, but at least we can interact. And there are two ways of doing that. Um, if you check your, the bottom of your screen, you, have, you see the chat window and the Q&A window or F&A for people who have it in, in German for Fragen und Antworten. Um, we've decided or we would like to ask you to use the chat window primarily for any technical um, issues or remarks. For instance, if you cannot hear us or if your, wind, your screen is frozen or something, you can put it in there and then um, we will take care of it mainly, or namely Janne. We will also use the chat window to inform you about relevant links. For instance, we've already uploaded the presentation, which we will um, soon be presented on the website, so you can already download it there. Uh, you also find email addresses um, of us and also the link to the study, um, which is the topic of the presentation. Um, the other button, the Q&A button, which is the one on the right, um, should be reserved for content-related questions of yours. So um, whatever comes to your mind um, whilst we're going through the presentation, put your question in there. And the idea is um, that we will um, try to answer as many of them. Um, I do expect to be, that there will be more questions uh, than we can answer. So we will uh, pick the ones that deem most interesting um, to, to most of us. Um, and then Jana will sort of ask them on your behalf. Once Jana picks a question, it's going to become visible for the rest of the audience. So everyone knows which questions have already been answered. Um, last thing, you may have noticed already that we are recording the webinar because we would like to make it available for anyone who cannot join right now. In case uh, you do not want to leave any footprints in the World Wide Web, um, I need to ask you to refrain from putting questions into the Q&A uh, section because, as I just mentioned, they will become visible for the public. Um, now, before we start with a presentation. Um, we are interested in finding out a little more about you. So we've prepared a little poll and I will start it and read out the questions to you because um, uh, the recording doesn't actually record 
it doesn't actually show uh, the poll. So what is your professional background? And you have three different possible answers. I have a more technical background. I have a more scientific background. I have a mainly pol policy background. First question. Second question, what is your specific interest in this webinar? First, first possible answer is, my main interest is technology. Second answer, my main interest is science. Third answer, my main interest is policy. And I can still see people voting, so I will leave it open for a few more seconds. I can see that already more than 100 persons did hit the button, and now it looks like now it looks like another three seconds. And I will finish it and make it available for you so you can see it. So we see the professional background of 41% is policy. 31% um, is scientific background and then closely followed by 28% with a technical background. So sort of third, third, third with a slight um, um, majority of policy background. Um, and actually, it's a bit similar to the specific interest because, or actually there, the main interest is policy, uh, was voted by 52%. And uh, the main interest science and main interest uh, technology, um, equal number 24%. So, with this, I will finish it and hand over to Matthias to start the presentation. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, hello, everybody. I'll show you what we have in mind for this presentation. We have first a short introduction and some key conclusions by Agora Energiewende and Agora Verkehrswende, our sister institution. We have then a technical analysis presented by DTU and MPI, and then conclusions drawn by the two Agoras, and then finally questions and answers. Now, this project is commissioned by the two Agoras, as I said, and we have the two research groups that did the research. And the basic question was, how many followed hours can offshore wind reach, assuming a huge expansion in the German North Sea until 2050? And we asked that because climate target scenarios for Germany typically assume around 4,000 followed hours. Now, to figure out what the answer could be to this question, we had two different forms of simulation, simulations of installed offshore wind capacity with two different physics-based approaches that include how the atmosphere reacts. And one by MPI is a box model implemented in a spreadsheet. And the other one by DTU is a numerical weather research and forecast model running on a computer cluster. To the right-hand side, you can see the hyperlinks, which you also see in the presentation that you can download, the publication itself, feed-in time series, and the Kiba spreadsheet model developed by MPI. So this is kind of the basic setting of this research. And here are the key conclusions in brief form by Agora, by the Agoras. Let me jump into the third one because that's the key conclusion. Offshore wind power needs sufficient space as the full load operating time may otherwise shrink from currently around 4,000 hours per year to between 3,000 and 3,300. And therefore, countries on the North and Baltic Sea should cooperate with a view to maximizing the wind yield and full load hours of their offshore wind farms. This is, in short, the answer to the question that we asked. And now let's look at the technical details. And I hand over to Axel. Yes, thank you, Matthias. So I'm uh, Axel Kleiden from the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry in Jena, and um, I will present the first part of the analysis and then in the middle hand over to Jake Badger from DTU. So um, what actually brought us together to this project were uh, two publications from about three to four years ago, um, over which um, Jake and I actually had quite a scientific dispute. And um, the, these, the key, images are actually shown here on the left and on the right. Uh, on the left, 
shows um, a, a paper from a PhD student of mine and myself from 2016. And what it shows is it's a hypothetical simulation with a climate model where the whole world is covered by wind turbines of different uh, installed capacity. And what we ask is how much wind energy can you maximally generate? And one important effect we notice is that as the installed capacity increases, so that's on the x-axis, and um, you first have a rapid increase in the generation, but then this curve levels off and even falls off beyond a certain point because actually the wind speeds decrease and due because the turbines actually remove kinetic energy from the atmosphere. Um, on the other hand, on the right hand side is a study by Patrick Falker uh, and um, Jake Badger was also uh, the senior author of this study and they looked at how the efficiency of wind turbines um, changes with the size of the wind farm. So the efficiency is defined as the um, what it a turbine would generate in the absence of other turbines. And so what it shows is that as the wind farm increases and the more turbines you have in a region, the efficiency of the turbines actually declines. And that depends on how densely they are placed in the wind farm area. So you have the top curve is the one where you have a low density with the lowest uh, line being the one of a, a high density. And so what actually, uh, so we actually did agree on the physics here in the sense that as you expand wind uh, energy generation by wind turbines, at one scale, you need to actually take into account that the atmosphere loses its kinetic energy. And so this is, um, um, I want to put this next, in, in the next slide, I want to put this in the context of wind energy um, estimation. And so what has been done so far is shown here on the uh, two cases that are shown on the left. So what's well understood is how an individual turbine generates electricity or also how a wind farm uh, uh, produces electricity, including wake effects that are shown here by the purple cone-shaped um, areas. But what we are talking about is a scale that is currently not observable because it is so large and so much wind energy is being used that we need to take into account that the atmosphere slows down because kinetic energy is being taken out. And this is shown on the right where we talk about regional potentials and this, reducing, this, this reduction in the wind speed is shown by this um, pink um, shape there in the diagram. And um, there actually what comes in is that the vertical renewal rate of kinetic energy is actually quite small. Um, and so we are approaching this, um, or to put this into the context and see whether this matters, we actually place this into the context of scenarios of offshore wind energy in Germany. So next slide, please. Um, so these are scenarios for a almost carbon-free energy system in Germany by 2050 and um, offshore wind energy uh, actually plays a major role. And so what's shown here are four different um, studies, four different scenarios that um, um, assume 45 to 70 gigawatt of installed capacity in mostly in the North, uh, uh, North Sea region. Um, and these scenarios expect the about 200 to 280 terawatt hours of electricity being generated per year. And this translates to the full load hours that uh, Matthias already mentioned, sort of in the range of 4,000 to 4,500 full load hours per year. And so the question now is to what extent do actually these wind reduction effects that we find in uh, these climate model simulations actually affect the potential? And so what we then did is, um, could you go to the next slide, please? Is that we set up a couple of scenarios and uh, we looked at the exclusive economic zone of Germany in the North Sea. This is here the um, uh, blue, blue uh, shaded area in the North Sea. You can see sort of in the um, right and in the bottom, the coast um, with Denmark, uh, Germany and the Netherlands. And we basically consider two different regions. The one is the area one, which is here marked in green, um, that is currently being considered for offshore development. But we also considered another area that would be possible that is further away from the shore, 
which is marked here in pink, which we refer to as area two, and which is uh, notably larger. And then we also refer to area three, where we considered all regions available for offshore wind energy. Then to develop the scenarios, we <coughs> considered different installed capacity densities, ranging from five megawatt of turbines installed per square kilometers up to 20 megawatt per square kilometers. Uh, we used um, hypothetical 12 megawatt turbines, uh, populated these regions with these turbines, and um, these scenarios then lead to a range of 13.8 to 144.8 gigawatts. So it covers actually more than the range that we is currently considered, but uh, to make it sort of more general, we considered this larger um, area, uh, the larger uh, setup. <clears throat> and so to briefly mention the naming convention that is going to show up in the following slides is that um, basically we uh, sort of refer to these different scenarios as installed capacity density and the area considered. So if we consider the case of five megawatt per square kilometers installed in area one, then this is a 5A1 scenario. If we consider 20 megawatt per square kilometer covered everywhere, then it is a 20A3 scenario. Um, next slide, please. So we then uh, use two um, physics-based methods to account for this effect on the atmosphere. So the left-hand side shows a method that, is, that we call KIBER. It uh, stands for Kinetic Energy Balance of the Atmosphere. It was developed in my group, which basically considers the um, region in which the turbines are being positioned, uh, uh, the, the volume of air of the atmosphere, and budgeted, budgets the kinetic energy fluxes in and out of this region. So it considers the inflow and of the transport of kinetic energy from upwind areas, it, it considers the mixing, the downward mixing from above, and it also considers the sink terms, which are um, turbulent dissipation at the surface, so surface friction, it's the energy extracted by the wind turbines for electricity, but also the wakes and whatever leaves the region um, as downwind. And so from this, we can actually account for an effective velocity and take these wind speed reductions into account. So it's a very aggregated, highly aggregated spread, uh, spreadsheet type model. And uh, we use Fino-1 wind observations from a platform in the North Sea. Um, so we use an observed climatology for this. Um, for the other method, um, the weather research and forecasting model, actually I hand over to Jake, who um, used this in the study. So please, Jake, um, I hand over the um, presentation to you. Thank you very much, Axel. So yes, um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jake Badger. I'm from DTU Wind Energy, and I will tell you something about the methodology that we used for this uh, study. So yeah, we were using the MISA scale model called the Weather Research and Forecast Model, otherwise known as WARF, which is a community model used by very many centers around the world, uh, also forecasting centers and research centers. Um, we have developed inside that a, a parameterization to, to model the effect of wind farms inside the MISA scale flow. So the MISA scale flow is a model that is used, yes, for common daily forecasting of weather. Um, it can also be used for many other purposes and we use it for wind resource assessment, numerical wind atlas studies. And the way we've used it in this study is to, to uh, and shown on the right there, is a map of uh, Northern Europe. And then we have three domains which are what's called one way nested down from a, a 18 kilometer resolution domain to a, a six and then to a two kilometer domain in the inner part, which is covering nicely the German Bight area of the North Sea. And the outer boundary conditions are given by the European Center of Medium Range Weather Forecasting ERA-5 reanalysis data set. And we use the year 2006 as our representative year or our case year because it had good representation of longer climates, uh, wind speed um, distribution, wind direction distributions and stability conditions over the German Bight area of the North Sea. Um, as Axel says that these two modeling approaches, although contrasting, do have a thing in common, which is that they are based on physical constraints, specifically the budgeting of kinetic energy in the atmosphere. Um, and this is in contrast to, to many of the engineering model approaches. So next slide, please. Thanks. 
So we're going, no, no one back. Yes, thank you. So, um, oh, hang on, it's one back again. There's a, thank you. No, it's this one, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Matthias. So we have a, um, we're jumping kind of straight to the results now. So what we have here is a description of the um, comparison of the keeper capacity factor on the left-hand side of the, on the y-axis, and then on the x-axis, the wharf capacity factor that was coming out of all of these different uh, scenarios we tested, going from the 13.8 gigawatt installed, which is the smallest installation, up to the 144.8 gigawatt um, installation. And I should say, because the Keeper model is so fast, we were able to do, or MPI was able to do many more scenarios tested. So actually there were 15 scenarios tested with different areas, different um, capacity, uh, installed capacity densities um, and so on. Whereas in the, the WARF uh, approach, it's, it's much slower, requires a supercomputer to run it. Um, and we tested a subset of that, we tested seven. And then with those seven, which were both uh, modeled by Kiba and WARF, we were able to do a comparison. So what you can see there is right at the top uh, right of that uh, figure on the left is the isolated points. So those are points which are from the two methodologies without accounting for wake effects. So we could call that in the mesoscale modeling a kind of reference where we have production but without the production of wakes. So we have generation of electricity without the production of wakes. And there you see there is a slight uh, higher production um, if Kiba and we think this may be down to the um, representativeness of the years. So Kiba used a different set of years for the wind climate whereas we used 2006. But what you see is you move down the um, through the other scenarios you see quite a good agreement between the two approaches because they the are plotted on this one-to-one -one line uh, pretty closely as we move from the, the small installation to the greater insta installation. So we're looking at capacity factors ranging from 50% without the wakes accounted, so it's showing there is good wind climate there, um, down to um, around 25% uh, um, for the very large installed um, um, capacity densities and, and large deployment of wind energy. On the right hand side you see something kind of similar, just a different way of plotting it, which is the different scenarios. So, so again we have the seven scenarios that were worked out with the two different methodologies and we see the yield, so we can look at annual energy production um, there in terawatt hours per year and each bar is a different uh, calculation. Kiba actually had a number of different setups you could use which had a different way of handling uh, wind direction but um, essentially they're giving um, sort of fairly similar results. Um, and we get, again, we see the isolated case. So this is the reference case without wakes and we see the case with wakes, both for Kiba and Wharf. So if you look down there, you can see um, that as you increase the uh, installed capacity densities and you increase the general deployment, um, you see a greater difference between the reference runs, the isolated runs and the cases accounting for wakes and that's true of both the Kiba approach and the wharf mesoscale modeling approach. So if we move to the next slide, um, we can see a little bit more about how the winds are reduced inside the different models. So the Kiba model is like this box model, so it, it's a very kind of bulk uh, approach to uh, addressing the energy budget inside the atmosphere around the wind farm, but again based on physical principles. So we can say um, here that what we see in the blue is the wind speed distribution of the undisturbed flow. So this is based on Fino-1 climatology. Um, and then we can see the power curve at the top of that, which shows how much production there is for a given wind speed. Um, and then we can see how the distribution of the wind speeds are altered by the impact of the wind farms um, pushing for taking out kinetic energy out of the flow and resulting in a different wind speed. You can see interesting effects also due to the when the winds are around the area of in the power curve of the rated power um, at around 14 meters per second or 13 meters per second and also in the cut-in at low wind speeds when the turbines switch on. So you can see this sort of uh, stacking up of wind speeds. This is an interesting effect that the, the method captures. And then on the on the left, uh, sorry, on the right hand side you see the wharf um, map, which is the average um, wind speeds over that year having put in the wind farms. And you can see actually there are 20 wind farms there positioned into the, um, wind, into the mesoscale modeling. And you can see how the wind speeds go from being undisturbed around 10 meters per second at 
uh, hub height and to around six meters per second inside the very large wind farms. And also that there's this like smearing out of this lower wind speeds as you move several tens of kilometers away from the wind farms themselves. So this, uh, the mesoscale approach gives you a spatial resolved uh, impact of the wakes, whereas the keeper gives you a bulk uh, uh, analysis of the wake effect on kinetic energy and production. Next slide, please. Um, so here we see uh, some more interpretation of the box model where we can look at the amount of energy flux going in and out of the uh, out of the box. Um, and it, there's also a repeat of the, the picture, the diagram schematic on the right there showing how energy can come into the box and how it can leave the box. It can come in with the horizontal lateral boundary condition and it can come in from the, 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 the vertical um, lid of the box. Um, and it can also leave from the other lateral uh, boundary at the, um, on, the, on the right there. And then you have uh, turbulent dissipation, that's the sort of the friction part of the loss. And then you have the energy extraction going into the conversion to electricity. And you also have the generation of the wake. Um, and you can look at that then on the right there and see this bar graph showing the energy coming in and the energy going out for different scenarios. And the interesting thing here is that the, no matter the scenario, you have the same energy going in, the lateral conditions, lateral uh, boundary and the top boundary are having the same flux going in. But what's happening inside the box is different. As, the, as you have more and more uh, installed capacity, there's a greater production, there's a greater drag, um, there's a greater production of, of wake loss. So what you see actually in the out one is that even though the installed capacity density is increasing, it's doubling each time going from five to 10 to 20 megawatts per square kilometer. The production is not, the generation there is not doubling in each case. It's actually going up uh, much slower than that. Okay, if we move to the next slide, this is more of an interpretation from the mesoscale modeling. Um, remember that plot Axel showed at the beginning, which was this efficiency versus wind farm area in square kilometers, where we saw this dropping off of um, efficiency and the wind climate around, um, or the, our setup here is, it, we can kind of look at it in the same way as and plot it uh, for each wind farm um, in the same on the same axis. So here we see on the on the right the big figure there is the relative efficiency of each wind farm now because we have spatial resolved each of these wind farms for the year. We can see each wind farm uh, given by the color, and then we can see the different uh, wind farm areas, and we can see the different scenarios where the wind farms have different installed capacities depending on um, on our scenario. So the first point I want to make is the efficiency drops for higher installed capacity density. So if we look at one of the wind farms there, um, which has an area of around 1,200 square kilometers, so one of the big ones in the outer sea, um, as we increase the um, installed capacity, we see its efficiency going down. That's marked by this orange arrow one. Then the orange arrow, arrow two shows that uh, efficiency for it is dependent on wind farm location and climate. It's not just the wind farm size alone, which was what was coming out of the 2017 paper. We only tested a single um, wind farm. So here we can see it's sort of more nuanced than that. Um, and then number three is saying that the efficiency depends on farm size and the proximity of large expanse of neighboring wind farms. So actually those, those arrows at three are pointing to, um, the green one is a, um, a wind farm in the inner seas, but actually very isolated in a sense, it's not crowded out by other wind farms. Whereas the, the orange one there, um, or the other, the other arrow three, is, uh, is out in the outer seas where a better wind climate exists for, from a reference point of view, but it's much more crowded by, by very large wind farms. So it, it has this behavior acting more like a big wind farm. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> and so um, the summary of the findings. Um, so we have estimated yields for, for installed capacity going from 13.8 gigawatts to 144.8 gigawatts for the German bite. We use two methodologies. One was the keeper box model and one was the wharf with the mesoscale wind farm parameterization inside it. Um, and these have shown similar uh, estimates for, for the production of these scenarios. Both methods estimate efficiencies uh, of going from 82 to 85% efficiency with the smaller installation uh, up to 42 to 48% for the very large um, and very dense installed capacities over both areas, inner seas and outer seas. Yield reductions are to be expected in currently considered expansion scenarios for the offshore wind energy. 
And you can read much more about this in the 70 page report that you can download. Um, and just to give an example of how the results are given, you can see here um, three of the scenarios presented in this table where you can read off different things like the installed capacity density, um, the total installed capacity, the, the yield that's coming out of it, the full load hours and the capacity factors and compare directly the two methodologies. So here we see a case for the 10 watts per meter, megawatts per square kilometer, a capacity going from 28 to 72 gigawatts, full load hours ranging from 3,400 uh, 3, to 3,000 full load hours and capacity factors from 39% to 34%. So there's much, many more, there's a whole uh, set of tables to, to dig into um, in the report. And next slide, please. And this is where I hand back over to Matthias. Thank you very much, Jake. Now, you saw the technic analysis by the two research groups. Now you see the conclusions drawn by the two agoras based on this analysis. And the one thing is offshore is important. Offshore is a key pillar of the European energy transition. And just to show you what that means is the European Commission and its net zero decarb scenarios has those two scenarios on the left and in the middle. And that's roughly 400 to 450 gigawatts of installed offshore wind capacity by 2050. Now, those who have high hopes for a lot of hydrogen, the Gas for Climate Coalition in its optimized gas scenarios roughly doubles this and adds 500 gigawatts offshore just and specifically dedicated to renewable hydrogen production. So we have high hopes for a lot of offshore. And if you look into European Commission modeling, you see offshore wind is assumed to reach 4,000 to 5,000 followed hours at very good sites. Now, Axel has already told you in Germany, we are hoping for 50 to 70 gigawatts, generating some 200 to 280 terawatt hours of electricity. Today, we have uh, eight gigawatts installed capacity roughly, and current plans are 20 gigawatts by 2030. So we need to increase the pace of spatial planning because reaching 20 gigawatts by 2030 needs roughly 1.1 gigawatt per year expansion. And if we then want to reach the upper 70 gigawatts by 2050, we need more than a doubling of then going to roughly 2.5 gigawatts per year increase from 2030 to 2050. So this is the outlook for Germany. But where does this lead us to? And just to one more time show the results in our aggregated way, offshore wind power needs sufficient space as the full load hours may otherwise shrink from currently around 4,000 hours per year to between 3,000 and 3,300. So you see full load hours on the y-axis, you see area in square kilometers on the x-axis, and you see some simulation results from Axel and Jake plotted in those colored dots. And we put an arrow over this to indicate how the full load hours come down. You still reach 220 terawatt hours, but still the full load hours come down. And so that's a very intensive use of the German bite. And the question is, can we and shouldn't we not just spread out the use of the areas for offshore wind across the North Sea through country cooperation to yield more followed hours? And we've indicated this through this plotted line, this arrow, the upper arrow, which is not a simulation result, but it's the idea that we should make the most of offshore wind. You saw already this one. I think uh, I will skip this because Axel explained it nicely. The key idea is that there's a very small, a small vertical renewal rate from above, and this is critical. You need more kinetic energy from above to replenish your wind speeds. Now, what does this mean for uh, Europe or the entire North Sea, it needs, from our perspective, it needs country cooperation to maximize wind yield and followed hours. You see a bit how the uh, borders of the EEZs are drawn to this diagram. We think we need broader maritime spatial planning, intelligently coordinated across national borders, because the one thing, the one insight really is, if we harvest the wind in some areas. We need to reserve areas for the replenishment of wind speeds. So we could, we should reserve areas for replenishment and those could be reserved for other purposes. That could be shipping corridors or nature conservation, but we need to think about both kind of areas, wind harvesting and wind replenishment areas. And maybe we should also think a bit more about floating offshore. We didn't elaborate on that, but maybe we can tap other waters and other areas with floating. Um, so essentially, those are our conclusions. 
Uh, I won't repeat them again. You have heard about the reduction in followed hours. The effect has been detected in the simulations here. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, this is our contact information. Feel free to write us emails on this. And now I hand over to Nicola. Yes, thank you, Matthias. Shall we leave the um, slides on or shall we go back into the gallery view? I'm just asking you, are you, are you going, to, do you think you will refer to it later? We could uh, first go to gallery and then later switch to the Oh, I do like this. It's really fine. Needed. You can leave it there and I just um, make us show on the right side of the screen for participants. Okay, so thank you for this uh interesting presentation for anyone who needs to check any of uh, the slides afterwards we've already um included the link to download the presentation on our website in the chat and before i hand over to janne um i'd just like to repeat how this the q a session will work you can put your questions and remarks into the uh, q and a or f and a fragen und antworten window please do not use the chat because this is reserved for um, us communicating links etc um, if your question is being uh, picked it will become visible for the rest of the audience and i can see this already been quite a few questions. So before losing more time on talking about this, I hand over to Janne and am excited to see what we will learn now. Hi, yes, also welcome from me and now to the Q&A session. Uh, you have posted a lot of questions already, so um, let's see how far we can get uh, with your questions. I will start off with the question posted by Berna Balci in the very beginning of your presentation, if there are any measurements, like real measurements, which show the decreasing of the kinetic energy in the atmosphere. Should I take that? Yeah, sure. So yes, there are. Um, there's a number of ways that can be done. In Around wind farms, for example, there often are um, in situ measurements made by anemometers on uh, especially erected masts around wind farms, and you can measure when there's a wake, when the wind farm, sorry, when the wind farm is putting a wake on that uh, measurement. So you can certainly measure reductions in wind speeds in that fashion. You can also look at satellite derived wind speeds, which give a sort of snapshot of the wind speeds around wind farms, and you can see uh, deficits caused by uh, wind farms, and they, they can extend for a um, number of kilometers, tens of kilometers onto the right. Um, stability conditions and you can also use uh, um, lidar methodologies to to measure these um, reductions in wind speeds and you can use radar so there are a number of technologies that can be used to measure the challenge is actually to to sort of scale up all of this going from measuring wind farm uh, wind turbine wakes to wind farm wakes and now we we have a study where we're looking at something which is more like wind farm cluster wakes and and it becomes more and more challenging how to measure that and how to measure the sort of the aggregated effect over months and years um, and the slowly the build up of the wind farms and so on so that that's where the challenge is is to sort of piece all of these measurements together and you also have um, production data from wind farms which can also be used to to sort of get a handle on these uh, wind speed reductions so yes there are measurements the the, the difficulty is um, and there are many many studies looking at these measurements is, is how to put it into the context of this study um yep okay then there is another question for you from martin Dürenkemper. um i see this study as a very important contribution to science but the effect uh you and as well um and and we as well are seeing in our models has not been proven in any of the large wind energy expansion areas the models do a relatively good job for smaller farm to farm interactions, several 100 tur mm. turbines, but this cumulative ef effect um, has not been proven by any production data to my knowledge or his knowledge, also because uh, these large farms do not exist yet. Mm. How confident are you with these results, especially also under the aspect that if we start increasing the areas for reaching the expansion goals based on your study, 
these areas will at least for the next 30 years be gone. So can politics really start planning for the future based on these results from your perspective? So this is a very good question and it's something we've also been um, having in our minds also um, within the Agora project group here. So, I mean, I would start by saying we do, we are kind of limited what we can test against because of what exists. Um, and I think that's what uh, Axel sort of alluded to in one of the early slides. Um, but of course, we're, we're really interested in using whatever um, does exist as, as much as we can uh, to do validation studies. And I'd, I'd say we're at the stage, and as you know, and uh, um, where we are able to look at uh, wake um, from wind farms impacting other wind farms. So maybe we're at now sort of um, two or three or four, um, maybe, you know, I've, I know we've had master's projects looking at two wind farms, um, how they influence each other. So you're right, there is a kind of gap into this, these large uh, scenarios of deployment. But in the other, on the other sense, we do need to be able to um, make, make these uh, projections based on physical models, um, which we think are uh, sound from a scientific point of view, which need to account for things which aren't accounted yet by, for by the engineering models. For example, that a large expanse of wind farms can have an influence on the synoptic flow on the geostrophic winds, um, which is something which is not yet accounted for by um, any other approaches. So um, I, th I think it's a, uh, a very good point, but it's also a point which is um, telling us what is our responsibility kind of as from a scientific point of view to be able to actually put up um, from the best of our scientific approach and physical based modeling, what are the, um, I wouldn't say kind of warnings, but I would say what, what do we need to be aware of to make sure we don't make um, any um, sort of underest or overestimates of the resources in, in this uh, sort of uh, precious but also limited um, area we have to, to make use of. So I think I'd let uh, Axel and uh, Matthias say something here too, because it, it was a, a, an important point. Yeah, I mean, I um, basically uh, agree with um, what um, Jane says. I mean, I think uh, on the one hand side, it's really important to look at the measurements and the observations to, to, to test, of course, you know, one needs to test with reality. Um, on the other hand, I mean, I sort of see the same kind of question, but uh, of course, with like climate change, where you also go to climate um, states that are not being observed, currently observed, and um, you need to sort of plan, plan for this. So I think uh, there's a certain similarity there. And so for that, I think um, that's why we also emphasized why we use this kind of physical uh, physics based approach to let us know what, what we can expect. Um, but actually also Matthias has an interesting policy view on this question. So um, I hand over to, to Matthias. Next. Yeah, just to <clears throat> just my two cents on this one. I think that we need to, to realize that policymaking rarely happens in a state of certainty. It's, it's rather the typical case of uncertainty, and it makes sense from a scientific perspective to make everything possible. But then now we're talking about the European, European Commission currently developing its offshore, offshore strategy, and that involves billions of euros of investment in the long run. Now, just basing this on the idea that, well, let's wait and see until 2050 to then measure something and figuring out that, oh, followed hours are not as high as we would have expected, I think that would be not a responsible approach. And therefore, kind of in the sense of a precautionary principle, not counting on 4,000 followed hours here uh, with uh, 50 to 70 gigawatts in the German North Sea would be more sensible, make much, much more sense uh, from a policymaking perspective because we, we have this uncertainty and we need to deal with it. Okay, so um, I have uh, um, collected three questions about the grid connection. So um, I will cluster them for you as the next part of the Q&A. Um, was the grid connection considered and what would possibly, what would possible impacts for, uh, be for wind parks that are spread more widely? Uh, was asked by Svenja Gelbke and Christian Tristan Kretschmer asked, have you considered how to transport the energy from multi-gigawatts wind parks to the land? And one more from Yannick Werner, from an economic perspective, how does spreading wind turbines further away from each other relate to transmission costs? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the quick answer on this one is that we did consider 
Yeah, uh, so this this is out of scope of analysis. This is, was really on the effect of many wind farms on followed hours to make it very short. And all the other effects, that's the interesting thing to uh, to add on our analysis, we think, because once you know about those effects and think about them uh, in a spatial way, the question really is how do you then design the best possible wind farms where could they be? How could we cooperate with other Europeans? And how could we then optimize the cost? Because this is not a cost analysis. This is a kind of scientific and physics, uh, physical based analysis. But of course, those are important follow up questions. Where to put the grid connections, what to do with them, um, maybe even converting something into a chemical and then transport that those are all interesting questions. But this is just the basis for it, what we delivered here. Okay, so then we have a more uh, one more question um, about the modeling to Axel Clyden um, from Lucas Falmer. Um, one of the main takeaways of your study is that you trust the results because they agree quite well between the two models. In former studies in 2015, you reported maximum wind energy potential of one watt per square meter or 1.3 watt per square meter for the North Sea. In this study, you are talking about two watt per square meters on slide seven. Where do, you, uh, where do these values come from um, as they seem to be the main driving factor of your Kiba model? And do you account for the effect that wind farms increase the vertical transport of kinetic energy? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that's a, that's a very good question. I think uh, what it actually, uh, um, the main difference to previous studies from my side is that um, the horizontal input, of course, plays a really important role. I mean, so for an isolated uh, single turbine, um, all the kinetic energy comes actually from upfront. Um, and so the horizontal flow is what carries the kinetic energy. Yet, as you expand in size and uh, you make the la area larger and larger, actually it's less and less energy in proportion that comes in. And so um, this is basically when you consider a smaller region, you have a larger potential. And if you can expand the region downwind, you get a smaller potential because the renewal from above is um, less. Um, so the two watts per square meter on slide seven, this is actually a mean value of downward kinetic energy transport that's um, diagnosed from meteorological data sets uh, and of which not all of it can be used for generating kinetic energy because uh, for, for generating electricity because some of it also is lost by um, um, friction uh, frictional dissipation um, and so in the previously we considered the very large limit where all everything was being used and so now we are um, looking at realistic setups where um, the use is restricted to certain areas. And so I think this points out that actually the, the, the wind energy potential actually depends on the size of um, deployment. I, I don't know if Jake wants to perhaps just add something on the scaling issue, um, which we also found in the study of Volker et al. Yes, it's a bit uh, referring, I mean, I'm are you thinking of the, the, the curve of the efficiency versus wind farm size? Yes. Yeah. So one of the figures if on, um, actually, I don't know if we could try to do that. Um, go to uh, slide 28 of the extra slides. I'll um, try. Yeah. Yes, the next one. Yeah. Um, so here we see the, the wind, farm, um, wind farm area increasing and it's, can relate that to what Axel said there. As the wind farm size gets bigger, so this one, which is around, um, <laughs> you can't see my cursor, but the third point, um, let's take the middle line, which is an intermediate um, spacing, which refers to around, uh, around eight uh, megawatts per square kilometer, if I remember correctly. Um, so then, and then the third point is for a wind farm that's 10 to the four um, square, kilometers. Now that's similar to a very large wind farm cluster that may um, would, would be on dogger bank scale. Yes. So, um, so we're actually, when, when we first were making these figures, we were thinking this is sort of, uh, is this really sort of crazy scales, but actually not. We're, we're looking at these scales when we're talking about uh, wind farm clusters in the North Sea. And you can see that the efficiency is dropping off. And we can understand that from the point of view that 
uh, the wind farm becomes more and more reliant on the um, flux that's coming from above and also that the within the, the boundary layer there's a, a reduced wind speeds due to the, the large number of wind turbines. Um, there was also another question I could maybe just bring that into this uh, figure to, to describe which is talking about the kind of rule of thumb um, approach. Um, sorry, if, <laughs> sorry, I know this is not, not to, to take Go over, ahead. but maybe just to, 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 to tick that one off as well, because there was a um, discussion about whether it was eight diameters or six or whatever. But um, what I would like to maybe see going forward is to use a figure like this as a way to sort of create some rules of thumb for thinking about very large wind farms. Um, and when we look around the world at different planning uh, or different um, scenarios for offshore wind farms and wind farm clusters could be um, east coast of China, could be east coast of US, or it could be around Vietnam or India. We see these plans. Maybe we can use um, a, a kind of rule of thumb based on a, a, a plot like this to see, given this, uh, a wind farm uh, size or wind farm cluster size, what kind of efficiencies may we be um, encountering without having to go through a lot of uh, meter scale simulations um, necessarily. We can look up the right climate, we can look up the, the correct uh, uh, wind turbine um, installed capacity density and, and get some sort of rules of thumb out of it. We could also maybe bring in the Kiva model to also be able to generate more sort of rules of thumb um, approaches. Um, okay, so I have also some questions about uh, yeah the um, the wind potential in general. Is there from one from Vinod Kumar? Um, is there any direct or indirect correlation between high low wind years and rate of vertical atmospheric replenishment for a large wind farm cluster? And um, maybe this is kind of related. Eric Lima asked, how quickly does wind recover between wind farms and what space between them would be required to maximize wind production in the North, North Sea? Yeah, perhaps I can take a first cut at mm. that. Um, and the, actually, the vertical rate and also what we showed in the introduction of these two watts per square meter that come in from the vertical, I mean, this is, of course, highly variable depending on the synoptic situation of how windy it is in the, in the free atmosphere. So it varies quite, quite significantly. Um, so in terms of the renewal rate, actually, that is relatively uh, low. And I mean, this has also been seen in some of the observations of the huge far field wakes um, behind wind farms in the offshore region. Um, that uh, this renewal rate, the vertical renewal rate is quite small and so the replenishment is actually quite quite small. So this is perhaps what I, I could contribute to it, but I'm sure Jake has some um, further thoughts on uh, these questions. Well, I mean, the, the one about how, how far spaced, I mean, to optimize, I mean, to, to, if it's strictly, I mean, then, then you want them as far apart as possible. But I mean, that's not, uh, as we know, this is um, we have to. This is just a first step in looking at the production. In the end, you need to put in some kind of cost model and know what does it mean if you have these uh, widely spaced uh, wind farms. What does it mean if you have to have uh, a low um, capacity density? That will also probably increase your costs for how to connect all of those uh, turbines and how to operate and uh, maintain a, a wind farm with all that additional area to cover. So. You know, I, it's very hard. The optimization question depends on what are your constraints and what is your objective function. So I, I don't uh, launch out into that. But um, you can see that these um, uh, wind farms in, in some conditions have wakes that are extending uh, tens of kilometers. Um, but that, does, that doesn't, that's not a um, necessarily, you know, uh, such a bad thing. I mean, you, you, it, it's, it's just a few percent and there's, I think it's too difficult to, to give a single answer on what is the uh, what is the optimal. Um, and I would also like to point out, even so, we see these efficiencies uh, dropping off. They, there's still a, a very large capacity in terms of what what could be what is the yield. So I think the next step has to be to to, to look at the um, the, the cost modeling um, to, to make it sort of to know what is the the, the threshold or what is the the right design. Um, but but the but I, I suppose our point is that we should be accounting for these large scale wake effects in that process. 
Okay, so at this point, I'd like to ask the panelists if there's any important question you want to pick up from the Q&A section, if I missed something uh, you want to dig into. There's still some open questions and uh, I yeah. guess we will not be able to answer them all, but maybe there's one question. You yes, I'll just have a quick. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, if, uh, if you don't mind, I mean, I, there's one question by Martin Dornkömper on um, the um, on the effects or the difference between on and offshore, and perhaps we can just uh, talk about this briefly. And um, I mean, I think that um, the reason why we don't so the question is why don't we see such uh, large effects um, onshore? And I think the reason why we don't see them onshore, I mean, they're few explanations for this one is that uh, currently um, the installed capacity densities onshore are much much lower than what's being considered for offshore so we're talking about um, at maximum about 0.5 megawatt per square kilometer at the regional scale that are currently being installed um, then um, in a, actually in a study we looked at uh, whether one can see those large-scale reductions in yields uh, in uh, observations uh, and we, we did a study on that but we couldn't find some statistical eff effects and I think one of the main differences between land and ocean is that actually the mixing mechanism the vertical mixing mechanism is quite different so on land you have a strongly heated surface uh, during the day that causes the convective boundary layer and you don't have that over the ocean and that's why you over the ocean you also see these large wakes behind behind large wind farms oh i don't take take if you want to yeah yeah so i just was scrolling through the questions there was an interesting question also about um in my understanding from paul when wendering um in my understanding oh just moved um these results are an average value for the wind farm areas considering it could in inside the box. Can you say something more about the distribution of the reduction in the different areas? Uh, we can see a large spread, so single wind farms with 4,500 4, full load hours um, and some with 2,000 full load hours, or will it be distributed more equally? So I think that's, that's something where you can see the difference between the Kiba and the, the mesoscale modeling approach that um, with the mesoscale modeling approach, you can kind of dig in a bit more deeply into these distributions. So we have the effect of, as you move away from the coast of the German coast, moving deeper into the German bite, you see that we have a, a different wind climate gradually increasing as you move away from the coast. Um, and then you can see the impact of, of wind, large wind farms on its neighbors. So you can see this kind of, uh, uh, quite resolved and um, nuanced behavior from each wind farm. And, and this actually raises interesting questions about how, yeah, how what should you, your strategy be for planning, uh, spatial planning of these areas, given you've got different resources um, as you move, say, further from the coast. Um, maybe there are some interesting ways to, to sort of uh, mitigate uh, and to also um, sort of uh, have good uh, cost savings on how you actually plan different kinds of wind farm um, with this change in climate and this different uh, effect of neighboring wind farms. So I'd, I'd like to say that what I like about this question is it's picking up on this idea of the distribution of the reductions, the, dist the different behavior as you are in different locations. And I think that uh, could be something also to, to explore and help um, maybe towards like uh, policy um, areas on, on how best to plan, uh, do spatial planning for offshore wind farms. Any other urgent questions you want to answer in the last minute of this webinar? Otherwise, there would be the question from Sam Williams, maybe looking in the future. What do you think are the knowledge gaps or tools or methods that now need to be developed so that developers, operators and consultants can address these potential regional wind speed deficits in their wind resource energy yield assessment? So when it says it's an idealized study, um, I'm not totally, yeah, it is partly because uh, the, the wind farms are sort of idealized as the same technology throughout, um, but they are sort of distributed in a way that's realistic. And the wind climate is actually realistic for two, year 2006. So it is less uh, idealistic, um, idealized state than the 2017 paper from Volcker. Um, but, but yes, you're right that it, it 
we need to be moving some towards something which is more operational, more um, possible for um, the, the players in the industry to to make use of. Um, and I think that's something we are um, addressing also to, to be able to find out, can we use, um, so the engineering models, what's, what is the difference between using, a, say, a, a, a different engineering weight model against using the mesoscale models? Can, can there be some um, ways of, of uh, maybe through that diagram I showed or the plot about making some rules of thumb um, corrections, perhaps? Um, but it could also be that we, we actually do a lot of mesoscale modeling and um, serve that. And also the members of the uh, wind farm developers, and, and um, they may also be uh, they have also some of them have competences in running the mesoscale modeling, so we could we could also build up a um, sort of competence base in in uh, doing that as well. Um, the validation, the sharing of data, um, being able to use all of this very complex data, which has different temporal characteristics, different spatial characteristics. This is also a gap, I would say, um, and something yeah, European and well internationally there are. Um, initiatives to, to, to work on this, um, to, to better the, 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 the methodologies and the science behind uh, modeling very large wind farm um, wake effects. Okay, with this, I think we get a close the Q&A session. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, sorry for overstretching a bit at the end now, and uh, I'll hand back to Nicola. Right. Thank you, Jana. And wouldn't it be nice to be able to go out and now uh, have a coffee over lunch or something and dig deeper into all those still open questions and into the topic? I really miss that. I have to say that. And I can't wait till we can have yeah, face to face events again. In the meantime, we stick to our webinars and um, we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you to Axel, Jake, and Matthias for presenting and also being here for the questions. Thank you, Janne, for um, putting an order into the questions. Um, if you have something really burning under your nails, uh, use the email addresses and uh, yeah, post your question directly to one of them. Um, we will put the recording of the webinar on the website. Uh, I'm uh, a little bit behind with all the uh, after uh, handling of, of stuff, but I hope uh, that next week we will be able to, to publish uh, most of the recordings of the webinars which already took place. Um, we'll continue. Um, on Thursday at 11 o'clock in the morning, it's going to be about how renewable energies can power Indonesia. And then we will have two more webinars next week, Tuesday and Thursday. They will appear on our website at some stage tomorrow afternoon. Um, the easiest to find out about whatever we have upcoming is to subscribe to our newsletter. And um, with this, uh, have a nice day, stay healthy and still at home. At least in Germany, some of the shops uh, have, have started to open, so there's a bit more we can do now. But yes, stay healthy, stay home, and see you soon. Bye-bye.